How much more room can global equity markets climb? Is inflation going to be persistent or transitory? What about the Federal Reserve? Can Fed policy be detrimental for financial assets or can it help financial assets soar in 2022? We're here to discuss these topics and of course trading and investment advice with none other than Peter Granich, a Wall Street and investing veteran who's been in the markets for decades. Peter, it's an honor to have you back on the show and get your outlook for 2022. Welcome back to Kitco. Well, David, it's always a joy to speak to you. I really and really enjoying the interviews that you've been doing, and I, I, I encourage you to keep up the good work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the words of encouragement. Let's get some words of encouragement for investors, too. We're going to talk about the assets that you don't like and, of course, that you do like. And, uh, and of course, your outlook on the economy. Let's start with the economy first and foremost. Do you see a recovery happening in 2022? I find it very hard to expect the uh, U.S. economy to have any, any sustained growth at this point in time. Uh, there are a number of factors, political, social, and economic, all mostly driving negative reasons to have expectations. I think we've seen the best for a while. I think we're going to continue to have problems on the labor front. Uh, we're going to have problems on the supply. And we're going to have real, real problems as we get closer to our election uh, on really the political hatred now that exists in the U.S. I don't think the U.S., David, and I can only speak to the U.S., has been more divided politically and socially uh, other than perhaps in the Civil War. And I think the ramifications of that are preventing what would normally be things getting done both on the congressional level and, of course, the state and local levels. And I think all that's going to come to bear here. And that's one of the reasons why the Fed's ability to have the influence that it once had has really shrunk and really is not the key factor for the stock market anymore. Well, the midterms are coming up in the U.S., Peter. Some would argue that uh, the government, Congress, does not want the economy to falter ahead of the midterms. They will do everything they can to stimulate the economy, to keep people happy, and to prop up markets. Do you agree with that view? Well, I would respectfully disagree because the Republicans would like nothing more to have the economy on its back rolling into those elections to point and say, listen, all of this is because of Biden and this and that. So I think it's a different circumstances than normal. And uh, I, I really think there's no middle ground anymore. The biggest trouble in America for markets and life in general is there's no middle ground anymore. People are either left or right. And there's really no uh, uh, willingness to sit down and work together. You know, when we had the 2008 financial crisis, David, it wasn't the best solution they came up with, but they were able to go in a room and work something out. I don't think that could happen now if we would face that tomorrow. And I, I don't think the markets have weighed yet how much the political disdain that exists in the U.S. is going to impact the economy. Okay. Well, this political divide that you're talking about, how does that translate to financial markets? Well, eventually, I know it's hard for some younger folks, but believe it or not, the stock market was once a place which you bought and sold stocks because you wanted to be part owner of a businesses. And believe it or not, the number one thing that impacted businesses was economies. Yes. So if and when it ever returns back to that, which it may or may not, but if it ever does, uh, if you don't have a bullish outlook, as I don't for the economy, then you can't be very, very bullish on the general overall stock market. And David, as great as 2021 was for a select certain type of companies, by and large, uh, a lot of companies didn't do as well. And we saw that from the stocks. We see a lot of stocks down 30, 50, even 70 percent from their highs. And I will tell you that if you looked at those people who bought at the highs, it was chances it was retail investors, not the sophisticated, uh, you know, institutional investors. So I think the retail investor out there is not in the shape that many people would think and hope that it is. And I think once it becomes evident that, that the Fed no longer has this magic foot or, the, or you only drive on one way streets, I think the market is going to go into at best a sideways mode and possibly into a fairly significant bear market that can last for a few years. Peter, you said that stocks used to be driven by the economy, the underlying fundamentals of the economy. Are you saying that's no longer the case? So what are they being driven by? 
Sure, Dave. And when I started in the ancient eras, when dinosaurs used to roam the earth, old, Peter. <laughs> back in the early 1980s, 90% of the trading was uh, the in regular investors. It was done on just two exchanges. Now, uh, when you watch some of the other financial networks and they, they, they shoot it from an exchange, that might as well be a museum because most of the trading is done on off exchanges. So about half the money now is in passive funds, Dave, which means it's not actively managed. It's not being decided upon because of individual performance of companies. They're trying to track an index, a, a type of performance. And the remaining 50% is really split among two different types of computer traders. They're simply the people that are, that, are, that are buying based on words and have programs based on headlines. And then there's people who are doing sophisticated quantitative uh, trading where they're selling something and buying and being long. Most of those people don't even know the names or even what the company does anymore, what the yeah. stocks that we make up, what they're doing. So it's a different species than it was certainly in the 40 years ago when, when I entered the business. And, and uh, eventually, those type of high-tech casino type of thinking gets impacted because eventually this does resort back to what it originally was set out to be. And that was a place where businesses can sell and people can buy and sell part ownership of companies. Yeah. Well, Peter, uh, technology may have evolved. Trading methods may have developed. The, uh, the technologies with which we trade may have changed, but market psychology, some would argue, has stayed the same. Let's talk about psychology now. Where are we in the sentiment chart that we're showing here on the screen? Well, this has become the holy grail for me. It was developed by a gentleman. I, I, it's probably one of the best things I've ever read and found in the 40 years I've been, been at this. And it really not only explains the cycles that you'll see in markets, but I think you can look at it in everything, sports, you know, teams, you know, that were once people were optimists and thrilled in and now they're despondent. Just ask a New York Giant fan that. But <laughs> the bottom line is that we have gone through this cycle. We, we, we pretty much spent 2021 for stocks and bonds and things like Bitcoin in the top of the cycle. You know, uh, wow, am I smart? Uh, you know, really excited. Now, maybe a couple of them slipped into a little bit of anxiety because they're off their highs. But then you look at things like gold and silver. Uh, they're down at despondency and depression. I mean, even people that once would speak about them on a regular basis, try to hide and try to talk about something else. So there's a real shift in sentiment. And uh, I believe eventually these cycles. Now, I, the timing is always you don't know, David. It could take years in a certain one or it could just take days. But my whole philosophy is if you buy during the despondency and depression, if you live long enough, you'll eventually share in the, in the upside. And if you're always buying up when everything is at you know euphoria, then you're going to really have a lot of problems. So I find that stocks and bonds and things like Bitcoin until recently were at the top of the cycle and things like gold and silver uh, and mining shares uh, really in, are at the bottom of the cycle. Well, let me ask you this, Peter. You've worked in the markets for a very long time. Usually, based on your prior experiences, usually does capital chase sentiment or is it the other way around? Do people become despondent or euphoric based on where the money has already gone to? Again, a, a great question that you do quite often. It, it used to be investment sentiment chased capital, but I think capital now just flows to what sells. You know, uh, and w where people want to be. That, that's why I think the, the cryptocurrencies of the world have done so well. And they did phenomenal. You can't take that away from, from what they have done. Uh, but uh, it, it's kind of like once you get a shift in that sentiment, then capital becomes very, very hard. People, people are followers, not leaders. Uh, most people, that's people are, are trend followers. It's very, and it, it and it's become quite hard to be a contrarian investor. I think if someone described my background, it would be that, hey, yeah, he's basically a contrarian. You know, he tends to do the opposite of what most people are doing. That's become a little bit more difficult because there's a lot of intra things now that mess. It wasn't just left or right or high or low. But, uh, but I agree with you that uh, I, I think capital, uh, used to chest sentiment, but I think sentiment now is what drives where capital goes. Well, that's that's a good point, and it leads me to my next question. This is not actually my question. This is a question that came in from one of our viewers, and he asked me, David, 
where is the smart money, quote unquote, going right now? Well, I don't know because I'm not smart. Okay? <laughs> no, that's not true, Peter. You're, you're well, smarter no, than most David, people. David, m- no one knows the future, okay? Yeah. Some of us been around and can make an educated guess, but, you know, I've lost enough money over a lifetime, the last many lifetimes. And unless you're Pelosi or a Fed official, you know, <laughs> that somehow manages to beat the market all the time, I still think it's a pretty difficult game. So I don't know about smart money. I do know that we've become... Uh, very uh, instantaneous on what we're doing. You know, it's just a matter of someone going on or somebody saying something or a group pushing something through the internet. And we get dramatic changes that might have taken months or years before there was this technology that you speak of. So I think one of the things that technology has led to is it's led to instant actions and sometimes overreactions that prove not to be correct. So what I do suggest to people, whether they have gray hair, no hair, or just getting hair, uh, to take a deep breath before you react. A lot of things are happening now that the second reaction tends to be the more likely way way that we're going. Let's go back to Fed monetary policy now. Monetary policy is a hotly disputed topic. There are those that say that three rate hikes in 2022 may not even be enough. In fact, Goldman Sachs came out with a forecast recently that said that the Fed may hike four times. Which camp are you in? three, four, or zero? I think the question we really should ask, Dave, is what will happen if we get those rate hikes? Yes. For instance, uh, as we talked, uh, Powell is speaking and he talked about uh, interest rates returning to some sort of normalcy. Well, David, again, going back to the ancient dinosaur days when I started, I remember when we went to look at our first house and the realtor said, you know, I think I can get you a 15% mortgage. Well, we were thrilled because mortgages had gone to 20%. But let's just say interest rates only go back to 5%. Now, that one time was not very high. It would seem high compared to where we've been the last several years. Well, we have $30 trillion in hard debt, David. That doesn't count what we owe for Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security, which could be tens, if not $100 trillion or more. At 5%, we would owe $1.5 trillion in interest. Dave, our best year was 2019 as a U.S. economy. We took in $3.2 trillion in tax revenue. We would pay almost half of what we took in in our best year just to pay our interest expense. That's a non-starter. The country could not function under such a uh, regard. So only one or two things has to happen. Either they're going to fold and, and, and try to artificially keep rates low again, or that debt's going to be, have to be restructured, reneged, or some sort of different system is going to be enacted. Uh, and the U.S. dollar would clearly fall out as the world's reserve currency, something that I think may or may not see in my lifetime, but you'll definitely see in your lifetime. So I don't think it's a question of how high rates go, but what happens if they do go high? Listen, the Fed has been buying almost at times half to two thirds of all bonds that are being floated out there. So they leave the market as he's claiming today that they're going to. What would you, Dave, what would you pay for a 10 year? I know if inflation is five, six, seven percent, I don't want a bond that's yielding only two percent. It's going to have to be five, six or seven percent. So I think that's the questions we need to look at. And there's no question about it that inflation is here. The genie's out of the bottle. This is not something they can just put back and go back to happy days. So with that in mind, I went a long way to answer your question. It seems to me that interest rates can only go substantially higher over time. Well, yes, but if you are bearish on risk assets like stocks or cryptocurrencies, we'll touch on that later. But if you are bearish in the markets overall, wouldn't you want to be long treasuries? Again, I didn't because I thought rates are going to go higher. My single largest holding became cash at the end of the year because I thought stocks and bonds would get very attractive in the next 12 to 24 months. So people go, oh, what an idiot. It only pays one tenth of one percent year at the moment. But if I can buy something that's 30 or 40 percent lower in the next 12 to 24 months, then it was very smart to be in that cash. And only time will tell if that was the move. But no, I, I don't think just because you're not as listen. Dave, the Federal Reserve killed the fixed income market. You see, when financial advisors, when we came to a conclusion the stock market was no longer advantageous to be, we would put our clients in the fixed income market. Can't do that now. There is no fixed income market. 
You know, there's nothing that pays anything that's really, certainly, especially where inflation has gone. And that's why people are at so much risk. And let me add this one quick thing. I'm in a 55 and over community. And so when I walk down to the community and people start asking me questions about the markets, one of the things I hear from all of them, and I think this is universal. Hey, Pete, I don't care if my stock goes down 20 or 30 percent. I just hope they keep paying the dividend because my lifestyle is dependent on those dividends. Well, one of the things that's going to be impacted if interest rates go up, the economy doesn't do as well, and the stock market doesn't keep rising and go down a little, you're going to see cuts in dividends over these coming years. And never have more people, especially the people who can lease and afford because they're out of the workforce already, a cut in dividends is going to impact people's lifestyle more than pretty much anything else that can happen. And these are all the things that aren't yet priced or discussed on a general basis, yeah. but will be if things keep moving the way I think they're going to move. All right. So you don't like risk assets. You don't like the equity markets. Where should people go then? What are you advising people to buy? Well, I don't advise anybody anything anymore. I just tell them what I'm doing. Okay. And if they- if, Your if personal I can, advice, your personal, your personal I, words of wisdom. I don't know if they're wisdom, but I'll tell you what I what I am doing. I, as you know, I was uh, I, I had come back to the metals in 2018, but then yes. the uranium market became, I think, one of the best places to be, and I stayed in that until this fall. And I didn't get out because I turned bearish on it. It's just that gold and silver and mining shares just came to a level that I've never seen in all the years I've been around them. Not only is it uh, kryptonite in the normal sense, it normally is treated that way by the general financial service industry. But I watch people that we always bullish on it, kind of turn their heads, either not want to answer the question or talk about something else. And it fits in that chart that we've shown. It's literally at despondency and depression. So I decided as great as uranium still was, there was even more upside potential in gold and silver. Now, I have to also tell you, because of my concerns longer term, especially for my child that, you know, will, you know, I hope to leave what I have for, there's going to be a concern about eventually the U.S. dollar. And uh, yes, so I want to own gold and silver uh, also as, a, as an alternative currency, uh, something that I didn't do often. I've always usually played it just for capital appreciation, but I own it now also as an alternative to paper currencies, particularly uh, against the dollar. And of course, uh, I know the eventual question is going to bring up that thing called Bitcoin. And some people think that's the alternative. Uh, but to me, uh, it's not, at least for me. Well, Bitcoin has been crashing. Uh, tremendous fall over the last couple of weeks. In fact, Bitcoin has had the worst start of the year out of any year in its existence. What do you think happened there? Okay, so... So I can watch all the comments come when you put up this video, some which are then forwarded to me in emails, texts, and even people call to tell me about how ancient and old and how out of touch I am and all the other Listen, things. Listen, Peter, the moment you've got haters is the moment you've made it. So congratulations on those emails that you've gotten. So, so it, it, here's the line. When, when we spoke and we spoke last year and I told people when we got to 65,000, I said, listen, this has been great. It's been a great speculative run. And please, Dave. The word speculative was created by Wall Street, so it doesn't call it what it really is, and it's gambling. And when you gamble, you have to be prepared to lose part or all of what you're putting in. So it got to 65000 and I said, listen, this is, this is beyond it, – it, this is part of the makeup of this greatest financial bubble of all time. I think you should sell it. And by the way, I do believe the cryptocurrencies are here to stay. They're going to go through what the internet stocks went through. They go through a shakeout. There were too many of them. And out of the dust came the Amazons and some other great companies. And so will that happen with cryptocurrencies. But I don't believe Bitcoin's one of them. And then I said the sentence that really got me. I was waiting for somebody to knock on my door with a gun. I called it the AOL of cryptocurrencies. Now, of course, younger people had no idea what that meant because they weren't even born when AOL was the king of Internet stocks. And the reason I said it was there were a lot, to me, better attractive cryptocurrency plays than Bitcoin. So if you want to buy into the argument of cryptocurrencies, which is OK as far as I'm concerned, if you're very long term oriented after this inevitable correction, which I think has begun, 
Bitcoin shouldn't be one of them because the technology and other factors. And the key factor is perhaps its most ardent supporter is someone who has told people to sell everything, put it all in Bitcoin and borrow if you have to. And I'll just tell you this, Dave. We used to throw people out of the penny stock industry for saying things like that in the 80s and 90s. So I want to bet against people like that, not on them. Okay. All right. Fair enough. Um, This leads me to my last and final point. Uh, For for, for now, at least, we'll have you back because there's so much we can talk about, but we've only got a 20, 25 minute slot. So I can't sit here for two hours with you, even though I like to, but I like to ask you about your investment philosophy overall. A lot of younger people or people new to the investment game would like to learn from somebody who's had decades of experience, somebody who started before the internet, somebody who started before dinosaurs were on the earth. I'm just quoting you. Okay. I'm not, I'm not saying that myself, but uh, anyway, the point is you've had a wealth of wisdom. What are some of the top mistakes that you've learned over in your career that you've observed either from other traders and investors or that you've possibly made yourself that you wish you could avoid if you had to go back in time? Well, the ultimate crime crime in investing is never being wrong. You're going to be wrong. It's staying wrong. Okay. That that's, that's number one. Number two, having made and lost millions, not once or twice, I can easily speak a whole show to you about the things to avoid and, and the mistakes to make. Uh, for me, making uh, money my God was perhaps the biggest mistake that I made. The hubris that I still see now in, 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 in more of younger folks and thinking this game is just easy and it goes one way, uh, there's going to be a lesson for that. But I would say that it, if, I learned, if I can say one thing to everybody, it's not going to be how much you make, but it's how much you don't lose which is going to separate you from the winners or losers. It, it's great when everything's going one way, but when things become somewhat difficult, I know it's hard to believe, but there may or may not be a bear market in some young people's lifetime. It's how much you don't lose during that period of time, which is going to separate you from a lot of other people. So I, I just, you know, I use a, a chicken in a foxhole to kind of describe where I'm at. And so I guess the last line would be is it's better to be a live chicken than a dead duck. All right, so let's let's take your example. Let's take a young person who's only seen a bull market in his investing career. Now, he has never experienced a market correction of any sort of significance that has lasted a long time. I'm not talking about 2020. That lasted one month at most. So I'm talking about a prolonged bear market that has that has the ability to wipe out most of the street. How should a young trader hedge himself if at all he's even interested in and hedging his long positions in stocks or cryptos or whatever have you that's risky? Well, of course, if you weren't very long in the stock market and you have such a dire market, which I don't know if it's going to get that dire, what I do feel is it's not going to keep going up in the way that it has. And people have built their lifestyle on a continuing, Dave. So I think that's what they should look at. I find Seven, you know, in the work that I still do with families, you know, I've worked with athletes for 20 years, no matter what the level of income, seven out of 10 of them are living a lifestyle, at least one level above where their finances truly support. And so the first thing I would just tell them is, have you ever even just tracked how much money you're spending a month? And people don't realize it until they actually do. And they realize that suddenly they're spending 50, 200, 300, 500 dollars more a month. And then I show them with a very low interest rate or a return, investment return, over 20 or 30 years, if they took that money and put it on the right side of the ledger, how much more they'd be worth. And young people go, wow, I never realized that. So I would say that one of the things is figure out what you're spending, less is more, and understand that there's bulls, there's bears, and there's pigs. And let me tell you, the bulls and bears each have their day. But till this day, I've always seen the pigs only end up in one place, the slaughterhouse. You mean you mean my friend's uh, obsession with trading on on Robin Hood should be uh, should be abandoned, Peter? They should put that uh, five hundred dollars aside every month in an index fund. <laughs> I'm not saying that people shouldn't gamble slash speculate. What I'm saying is look at and yeah. what you think is going to cost, and if you have those excess dollars and you can still 
live your life reasonable. Someone or your family or even yourself is is, is not having something because you, you, you're speculating some other place, then go do it. But seven or eight out of 10 people shouldn't be doing it or be doing it at the level that they're currently doing it. And only on the time, Dave, I'm certain if we were talking to me 30 or 40 years ago, I wouldn't be saying that now. It only comes from the experience and have lost and seen. I've seen so many people, so many one hit wonders. You know, there's a woman now that down here that everybody was raving about a year ago and the funds and all. And yeah. I, I've seen so many of those come and go. So I, I would just tell the person error on the side of caution. Uh, not, last question. I'll let you go, Peter. Not a financial question, but maybe a career career oriented question for those younger people seeking career advice. What should they study in college right now? If you were to look ahead and project where the world's going in the next 40 years, what should they be learning and what skill sets should they be developing? I, I, I say this very seriously, no matter. First of all, I tell everybody, I do answer, learn Chinese, because I have to tell you the way the world is going and how we're going, the United States will not be the dominating country that it once was over the next 30 or 40 years. Having said that, and having never even finished high school, I'm not the person to speak to about how great a college education is because what I learned so-called hands-on experience is worth anything more than any professor could have told me. But there are things that are required that you need an education for. I'll tell you what is lacking, and if people, which is a huge problem in the U.S., I don't know in Canada, tradesmen. Uh, you can't get somebody that's a good craftsman anymore. And uh, th there's going to be a lot of money made for a good plumber, electrician, a wood carver, all that type of stuff. And so before running off to college and spending 50 or 75000 a year, if you have the ability and God-given talent to do something with your hands, uh, that may be better off than any degree you can get. But that's just my opinion. All right. Well, words of advice as always, Peter. I'll have to pick your brain on uh, other areas of life that uh, we could talk about. Uh, but uh, next time, Peter, and uh, we'll have you back on to talk about much more with the markets as well. Thank you so much for your thoughts today. Well, Dave, I don't do many interviews anymore, but I really have enjoyed watching your career go. And the, 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 the level of your interviews now and what people are getting out of them is just better and better as time goes on. So keep up the good work, whether or not you have me back. And I, don't, I won't be hurt if I'm not. I just want people to know you're doing a really, really good job. Well, thank you. I uh, appreciate it. We'll have you back on for sure. Well, look, I'm not a carpenter or a tradesman. Maybe I maybe I screwed up my career there, but uh, I'm definitely happy to hear that uh, I'm making somewhat of a difference, at least for the viewers out there. So thank you for your participation and, uh, and uh, thank you for being here. And to the viewers, thank you for watching. I'm David Lynn. Stay tuned for more.